So good, good evening. Welcome. Thanks for coming out this evening. Um, it's been um, quite nice to um, feel that sense of buzz, that sense of anticipation. Uh, it's, uh, it's a special place, a lot of special evenings, but this one is uh, uh, as special as any and more so for us. Um, once a year we host the Kylie Lecture. Uh, in honor of uh, Daniel Urban Kiley, and we often uh, recognize uh, one of the world's uh, great practicing landscape architects, and so we're very pleased in that space to uh, welcome back uh, Michelle Devine. Um, I think as many of you uh, know, uh, Michelle and his work first came to be known to us across this side of the Atlantic uh, maybe 14, 15 years ago now. Um, uh, initially in partnership with Christine Del Gnocchi and now under, under his own name. Um, and in that context, I remember distinctly um, being uh, in Philadelphia and then also then later being here in Cambridge and watching the, there was a moment when, bless you, there was a moment when um, American schools kind of remembered that France was there. <laughs> there was this moment in the, uh, in the 1990s in particular, I recall, when it was as if we all suddenly rediscovered uh, that landscape architecture was of French extraction. Um, for those of you who, that have um, just gotten a copy of the Harvard Design Magazine in your box, you um, may not have read yet, but take, take a look at the, um, the pieces arrayed there. You'll, you'll find, among other things, a range of, a range of uh, French authors and points of view, but also a, a little piece in which I've argued that, in fact, the origin of the professional field itself, the origin of landscape architecture, can be found uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a French origin. Um, in that regard, uh, it's not a surprise in a way, um, uh, but really for me something very specific, specific about uh, Michel's practice that it seems to have embodied, and I think it did when it was first apprehended here in North America, but has through his most recent work, um, a set of paradoxes. On, on the one hand, it embodies uh, natural and ecological processes in a way that I think many of us can identify and has, have, been, have been commented on. And at the same moment, um, it didn't seem to get caught in that cul-de-sac of kind of um, continually delayed gratification, but actually arrives in form and often in urban form and quite consequentially uh, so. Um, for me, I remember the moment I first saw the project for the Confluence in Lyon. And I thought, well, this is, there's now a different time after seeing that project. Uh, and over the course of the last several years, uh, Michel's urban commitments with that regard have continued, in fact, swelled to the point that he was awarded the French National Prize in Urbanism in 2011, uh, um, among France's highest honors. An extraordinary accomplishment for a landscape architect who, uh, in the introduction to his recent book, described himself as um, having nothing to show for that half career of effort. Um, I think he's put that myth to rest. Uh, particularly, you should also keep track of his recent North American commissions um, done work recently at the Walker Arts Center, the Dallas um, uh, Center for the Performing Arts and the St. Louis Art Museum, among other commissions that are still alive, I think. Um, uh, this evening, I'm hoping we're, we'll hear a little bit um, a little bit about the Port of Marseille and the other uh, present engagements of Michel Devine. Please welcome Michel Devine. Okay, uh, 13 years ago, I spent two semesters in this school trying to convince every student and uh, sometimes myself that landscape architecture could be a driving component in the recomposition of our cities. With some students and with Pierre Bélanger, at this time my assistant, we developed transformation process around Boston. I must confess that it was an announcement. Uh, landscape architecture at this time in Europe and in the US was absolutely not a serious component of urban design. I must confess also that what we did uh, here in the GSD was um, a strong resource and, uh, for, for my work after. Um, today I'm very hopeful and proud to show uh, a very short list of projects where um, some progresses are visible. I will, I mean, you know, I will do it as French people, so it's a kind of improvisation. Um, I will mostly spend time on one project, 
because it's a very interesting case study. It's in Saclay. It, it, it's a very interesting case study. I'm not especially speaking about what we did, but the kind of commission it evokes. And then we will have little brothers, I mean, other project, but shown in a very short way. And it's a menu, depending on time. So just a few words about this project in Saclay. I know some students and teachers have been working with um, Antoine Picon on this site. So first, um, the drawings I will show are mine, but they are also uh, Xavier de Gaeter, um, Belgium architect, Floris Alkemad, who used to be urban designer for M. Colas during 20 years, and sometimes some drawings will be from OMA, Rem Colas office. It has been a competition, and, um, and I won this competition as a leader of a team. And this was the first time in France, on the recent period, that a landscape architect could lead such a big team dealing with um, urban design. I will speak about um, scales, coherences, and coherence according scale. Um, just in two words, it's an important commission state. This is probably known even, uh, I, I guess you, you heard about it. So 15 years ago, st French state decided to create a strong campus about engineer sciences. So, and as you know, a cluster unifies academic field, research, and some um, economic activities. Okay, we start. So, on, so what we what we we have to deal with seven thousand hectares, and I will only show what happens on the white perimeter. This is a seven thousand hectares perimeter, and you can see Paris. So, this is a very important project for state, and it is part of uh, this project of Le Grand Paris. Of course, it's a transformation process, and our commission starts with a six-year-long contract. You can see Paris in the back, and you see some geography, and you see agriculture. What we just see is 2,300 hectares of agriculture. But not only, I mean, here already there are 15% of French scientific research on the site. I mean, um, I don't know how to say that. I mean, thousands and thousands of researchers have been working there for 60 years. Um, th there is a kind of development in the very middle of the picture. This is uh, the Nuclear Research Center, and it has been done by uh, Les Frères Perret, very famous architect, 60 years ago. So just to let you know, it's, not, it's, it's still a transformation process. We are absolutely not in a new city process. And this is a paradox. I mean, the picture on top shows this kind of image one could have. So it looks like a nowhere, agriculture. But the second picture shows this 15% of French scientific research already located on site. And this is this very poor existing place. But when I say poor, it's not the right word. So you have Ecole Polytechnique, a famous engineer school. You have a strong research center for uh, agronomic. You have um, a strong research place for electronic, and you have this last picture on the bottom with this nuclear research center done by Frère Perret. And by the way, just to give you, and, and this synchrotron, you know, place for electronic uh, acceleration. And just to give you a sense of scale, because this is really the hard story, um, the development for the nuclear site is 250 hectares. And um, as a reference, a strong development in Europe is this site. 
and usually it takes 30 years to build it. These pictures shows, you know, this kind of ambition. So it will be part of a short network of big um, clusters, hopefully. And this is just about the 7,000 hectares. It's big, as you see. So sorry about the unity. We'll speak mostly about kilometers and meters, but I think it's easy to translate. So how to do that? You know, we're in front of the 17 kilometer long, 14 kilometer long, but the whole side, by the way, is 30 kilometers long. So we will have to address all these scales in the same moment. And you will be shocked, but we refer to American history again. And, um, but a recent one. Uh, Washington, as you know, has been expanded uh, at the beginning of the 20th century by Olmsted, but the son-in-law. And he, he developed Georgetown, a park system, um, which is very interesting because we have a lot of documentation on it, which was not the case at the 19th century with the father's work. Of course, we all know this plan done by a French, by the way, L'Enfant, but this is not the purpose. And it's about the West expansion. This was, these maps are from Homestead uh, son-in-law, according to what we know. And this is the existing site. You always have the two kilometer reference. And this was in 91. The project here is about building a park system to organize universities around Washington. So for us, fantastic, exactly what we need as a reference. And what is more, I mean, an anecdote, but interesting, and I love this movement from Europe and America, you know, anytime, because of course he moved and he, he, had, he traveled in Europe. And of course he was deeply inspired, he fought by European landscape, and so this is London but with a strong irony, this is Paris, and in the very bottom on the left, there is Saclay. So, you know, it's, it's very ironical. And of course, he referred a lot to this famous masterpiece here in Boston. These pictures are very interesting. So, because these are pictures, and of course we didn't have pictures from the father. I mean, a very few of them. And what I really love, and this is my understanding, maybe historian could be shocked by what I will say, but there is, according to me, an invention of the pre-existing natural geography. And by the way, this natural geography is as poor as these pictures are. I mean, like sewage system and not rivers, not creeks. So he literally make um, an atlas, an inventory of all this small pre-existing natural geography. Then. He purposed this transformation. So the parks, so you see the section of the same creeks and valley, with of course all road system, water, storm, stormwater collection, and the landscape. And for us in Europe, it's fantastic because there is a big misunderstanding with American park system in Europe. I mean, I do understand that your park system was a kind of viabilization. Maybe somebody can help me to translate that. It means. You know, like you create the first track, the first way, the sewage, uh, access and address, it, it has a function. It's not an, a park and a road. In Europe, we usually do two different layers. There are the road system by engineers, then a poor landscape architect will come later or never doing some parks. But never today, the idea to combine a landscape and uh, infrastructure network happens. And what was extremely interesting in this way, so there is in a geography and the expansion of a pre-existing geography is a support of the creation of an infrastructure network. And the whole thing has a coherence deeply rooted on a pre-existing geography. This is my understanding, maybe a little bit exaggerated. So, you know, I really love these four pictures we have seen in this four section. And this was his plan. This is 
what exists today. And, and it's fantastic if you think about what were these creeks and what they are now and what they are still. And for me, it's a fantastic reference. So you see one kilometer, and I call it, it's a personal translation, of course, and interpretation of geography amplifié. You can understand what it means. And you, as American people, know exactly what it means. So of course, they are all ways and parkways and bridges and every infrastructure are within this park system. It's potentially nice. <coughs> Uh, it's nice. <laughs> and you know, it's great. I mean, it's not everything, every road, every people and water is in the park system. Okay, so now we start. And this is the first scale we'll address. This is a 30 kilometer scale. And still you have Paris in the right corner on the top. So, the green, the dark green, corresponds to some pre-existing topography. They are a gentle slope, like small hills. So there is a plateau and a valley. And between, you have all these green uh, surfaces. And it's very important. It's a poor geography around Paris. Le Nôtre, by the way, and Fez is a poor geography. But, but we still have this kind of small green topography. So this is the first support for us. And in the very middle of the picture, you have these 2,300 hectares of agriculture that are absolutely um, untouchable. I will translate later. You, you cannot touch it. So this is the first layer of proposition. It's as exactly uh, American landscape architect did, we purpose to amplify this natural geography. What does it mean? It's just to add more trees and wood on um, this pre-existing topography. I mean, it's not um, a big transformation, but of course, when you think about the scale, it's a big transformation, but it's just giving more coherence, more unity to or what already exists. And the so it will be very difficult, I must say, first. Um, so these red areas correspond to campuses. But when I say a campus, it corresponds to a place like 2,500 2, hectares. Because it's like that. It exists now, and we are going to intensify these pre-existing campuses. And we are in charge of these like 10 important campuses. And we start to accept the idea that it will be an archipelago of campus. Because it is like that, we have to transform it. But to deal with this amplified geography help us accept the archipelago idea. I mean, there will be a unity of it, because we will have an horizon line from both valley and plateau that will give a unity physically and visually to it. Of course, to make it work, and acceptable. There will be a strong transportation system that will connect these intensified campuses. And a metro has been voted, and it's part of the Grand Paris project, and it's now um, voted, really. And you see the red line that will connect the main major part of these campuses. So now we, we have to work on another scale. So the main part of the campus exists and will be developed now on this south that corresponds to a 10 kilometer space. And again, it's not a desert. Today, this is maybe more than 10% of French scientific research. This model shows you know, the valley, that is a kind of what French people call a city, that could be also um, qualified as uh, urban sprawl, and it looks very similar to America, by the way. On this plateau, this pre-existence corresponds to very big buildings. You can see the comparison with Tour Eiffel. And we have a kind of strange urban design done by these big parts. 
this is absolutely not what a cluster must be. You probably heard a lot about this cluster vision, where what is expected is relationship and connection between people and disciplines. And of course, with this huge building, you know, like 200, 300 meters, uh, there is no connection between people. So this is what exists today. So these are the research center existing, and this is was what will come in the coming years. And still, you know, with this comparison, it's big. So um, it's exactly between La Défense and Le Louvre. So it took a certain time to build the first picture on top. And, and, <laughs> and we are supposed to do it rather quickly uh, for the second one. So, so it's still very scary, you know, what to do with such a scale? What meaning it has? How to do it? And we have to do it because it's already existing. You know, we cannot say, no, it's stupid because this could be done. Okay, so um, on the same plan, we, the black on top correspond to the famous agriculture. Uh, the the, the grey, the light grey, corresponds to this geograph geography. And the green corresponds to the surface we have to deal with, so 900 hectares for this special part. The grid corresponds to one kilometer. So with urban designer, what we try to, con to do is to work with capacity and to reduce the surface of this development to 400 hectares. It requires a huge density, and it's not easy to convince people, including researchers, to work with density, to, to live in a dense place in the middle of a countryside. It's not that obvious, by the way. Mathematically, it leaves 500 hectares to build a kind of park system at this scale. And this is very important for me because it corresponds to what I call an intermediary landscape, which is not really a, a agriculture and which is not either a public space. It's something in between. And it's very important for us to give some correct condition for these campuses. So by the way, still we need this reference. This is a separate position of Georgetown and our place. And I see that, of course, we are, we are dealing with the same kind of issues. Now we'll see layer per layer. So this is existing geography, natural geography. This is the part of our expansion of geography. The, the, the green, the new, this is light green. And, um, we, we, we lose um, the, the scale, but it corresponds to three kilometers long of additional wood along a road. It's not nothing, I mean, to plant three kilometers along a road in a substantial way. But as you can see, it's definitely not enough to give any structure to this. So to amplify geography as a meaning at 30 kilometers, it has no effect at 10 kilometers. It has an effect, but not enough. So we have this um, kind of intermediary landscape on 500 hectares that will really help build a body for it. Now we are writing a book with Birkhauser about some project, including this one. And what I try to do, even like his, this improvised lecture, is to really find what are the real ideas, not in a political, neither commercial way, but really what are our ideas and what is the story of ideas. And um, it took us two years to found this solution because we were blinded by this geography system and it was not enough. And we, to find this 400 hectares was not easy and we convince people and politicians to do it. Now it's written on all laws and maps. And, and that's, that's something, you know, in a part frustrating. It's not, I cannot show fantastic pictures, but it's extraordinary, I must confess, to, in three years to convince people to do that. Then another very important component, which we call main public spaces in chain. 
I will explain that later. This corresponds to these yellow parts. Every quartier, every campus will have a key major public space, and they all are connected along the metro. This is the metro. And this will be, I mean, this is a prefiguration of drawing, of course, but in gray, you have existing buildings in white, possible blocks. And that's for me an important picture. So you see one kilometer, and this is where we are now with all this network of public spaces for this 10 kilometer scale. You will recognize, so first, this intermediary landscape, these public spaces on chain, and also all a network of pre-existing pathways and um, park in a valley and public space along the valley, and the whole things, according to us, start to give serious condition for a certain success to the implementation of these campuses. Some details on components. So what means these public, main public space chains? And it corresponds to a Belgium reference in Brussels. When people expanded the city on the east part, they first built a metro, and along the metro they started to build main public spaces like parks. And around these public spaces they start to build city. And it's a fantastic reference to develop a place. <coughs> now, a few words about what is this intermediary landscape. As I said, it's between agriculture and public space. And by the way, this is in China. And uh, a university has been built within rice fields. And they kept, I mean, it's probably totally artificial, but they kept part of the spirit of the place with this very strange um, park. But of course, we, we are dealing on this campus, we will host uh, all agronomic engineers, and we are working with them to develop a new agronomic, I mean, not a new. This is known, but not experimented. And we want this intermediary landscape to be the part where this agronomic school will develop new technique. Why is that so important? I will tell you after. Okay. It's not a good place. Uh, this is... Um, a reference for what it means, I mean, dealing with nurseries and uh, wood. This is a fantastic landscape drawn by Alle Osper, who is dead, but he used to be a fantastic landscape architect in Holland, and he built the last new city in Almere. It's extraordinary. Okay, but what we want to do is, we want to use this to <coughs> first manage time, because even if this will be a fast project, it will take 20 years. I mean, 15 as a minimum. Politicians believe five. Um, probably 30. Anyway, we know it will be long, and we will have to use landscape to accompany uh, all this transformation process. And it means that first we will build it, and progressively all this building will work with. We will do that because we will have to face huge um, earthworks. You know, as soon as we built building and built roads, we will have to deal with big uh, volume of materials, and we will use this intermediate landscape to host all these materials and even to improve the quality of earth. Of course, we'll need it to um, man to, to collect storm water. We'll need it to have nurseries. We'll need it for a lot of reason. And, and we are already starting it. We need, at the very beginning, some provisory car parks, and they will be uh, on this landscape as well. This picture, that is from another project, by the way, um, just shows the character it could have. It's not really a countryside, it's not really a campus, it's in between. Of course, it can welcome sport activities, and this will be the case very soon. This drawing shows a prototype that will be built in a few months, so we, we already will have one hectare done in a few, um, I mean, now, months. Where we will experiment, even with this agronomic school, every component. 
I mean, stupid uh, rendering to show that. <laughs> if one doesn't understand. Okay, and this is for this 10 kilometer, a very provisory axonometric that shows this development and the connection with this intermediate landscape and agriculture. So again, why is that so important? I, I did an answer to my question. And um, because we have the same kind of urban sprawl you have. We just said before the lecture that, of course, we are very marginal. And 50% of construction in France is um, about individual housing. And we have sort of camp. You know, there is no limit, as in America, you will recognize. There is agriculture, and there are these mass of houses, and nothing in between. I mean, never in uh, human history this happened. I mean, it's terribly poor. One believed to live in country, and there is even not a path that connects this quartier with the country. And this is ridiculous in France. Working with Jean Nouvel for Le Grand Paris, we recognized 800 kilometers of this very poor hedge between this housing and the countryside. And we think this hedge, this frontier, must be exactly what we try to invent here, some intermediary landscape between city and country that will give almost a network of path for people to, to be um, allowed to walk in the country and potentially to build strong activities with a very intense uh, local agriculture, with glass houses, etc., etc. So we hope this campus will help really invent solution to be expanded at a, um, you know, at a big level. I mean, it's a very, it's, according to me, it's, a, it's an issue of society. It's, I mean, we cannot accept our contemporary to live in such a condition. So now, sorry about the very scholar way to show it. So 2.5 kilometers, one quartier. This is existing condition. And again, you have this huge building in the middle of nowhere. And we have to host a crowd. And maybe I can, uh, this is a picture from uh, Floris. And just look at the drawing on the bottom, right, where you have the existing big blocks and some dense and compact and intense quartier. This lane will be a kind of city within these very big uh, buildings. And this is the location of these big blocks within the big buildings. Again, we must not forget that it's a transformation process. And again, the gray buildings correspond to existing buildings. But we must give an identity, a, a real a strength to this accumulation of buildings. And you will recognize your place, of course. So you recognize, even at this scale, all the components. So from the top to the bottom, to, to, okay, from the top you have this um, expanded geography, then there are parks, then there is a public space campus. And at the end, we have this intermediary landscape. So even at this scale, we will find everything. But of course, the main component, when it's small, is not the geography, but the public space. And this is what we are doing, you know, the pink. We try to have a network of intense public space that will give the unity and the identity of this quartier. Usually, this is a big project. You know, when we are facing this kind of commission, we are very happy. This is a part of what we are doing. But we must keep concentrated. And of course, to, to have this successful is not easy as well. And in new cities, this corresponds to the scale of new cities in Europe. And architect and urban architect have been doing you know, all a mixture of what they believe, like piazza, rue, ruelle, Rue Piétonne, I, I, I hope you understand French. And, <laughs> and sometimes park and garden, all this palette of uh, typology of public spaces. And sometimes it looks totally fake. These piazza in new cities are just boring because they do not correspond to all users during times that built a piazza in a city. And again, Back to America. So we think 
So first, there is a special typology for this band, and all buildings will be built around large courtyards. And you know, this is the kind of classic work we all are doing. It's a very small part of what we are supposed to do, but again, you know, you, you know where you are. And for me, it's very important. You know, um, James Corner, I mean, like 13 years ago, explained me, inviting me at, at Penn, that all these uh, American campus in part have been drawn by French people. You know that, L'Enfant, I guess, and others. And what I really like in this campus, in this it's a public space. It's definitely urban. And I was walking this afternoon in your place, and I do remember how intense uses are. But it's a kind of garden. It's a kind of hybrid between a garden and a piazza. It never happens in a city in Europe, because in a city of Europe, you have an administration. And there are people for piazza and streets, and there are people for gardens. Usually, they don't meet. There are directors, and of course, they cannot mix up. You know, so you will have piazza and gardens forever, except in Barcelona, Lyon, and some cities that have been pioneers in just moving their administration. In this campus, I definitely think this is a fantastic and very contemporary um, typology. So we just propose to do something like that, you know, of course, in our way. We are close to finish this project, but again, you know, if we start from the smaller, so we have the two, three kilometer, and we see that what will make it work is public space and sometimes a major public space. When we think about the 10 kilometer scale, what will make it work is the park system. I mean, and especially in this case, the intermediary nature. At the other scale, so again, you have the 10 kilometer frame and then the 30 kilometers frame. And we see that for the 30 kilometers frame, what works is this amplified geography. So it's not homothetic. We, one would say that we work on the same way at every scale and we need the large scale to work on the small scale. It's not true. It took us a certain time to understand, I must confess, because it's very reassuring to think we have been looking at a very wide landscape, so now we know exactly what to do on the small part. It's fake. I mean, every scale has its language, its issues, and its solutions. And the whole scales must be coherent, and the whole solutions must be coherent. And it's a very long way. So when I show this picture, when I see these pictures, they are not necessarily very nice. I've been more impressed by the exhibition of students' work in your hall. But this corresponds to, to a real commission, and we have been convincing people with that. I mean, a, a lot of people. And that's why I show them. Now, a study model that has been produced for uh, Rotterdam Biennale, and we'll make a tour on the model just to recognize all what we have been saying. So I think it's a good model because you can see this geography, you see intermediate landscape, and by the way, of course, it's not um, a belt, it's not a green belt, which would be ridiculous. In any case, to give more quality to this hedge between city and country, we have to build a green belt. Green belt is terrible. I mean, it's a medieval solution. We want it to be very articulated, very with a lot of diversity according to what we meet on site. And there will be wood, there will be field, there will be sport um, areas. You recognize development, you recognize geography, you recognize main public spaces on chain. Metro, intermediary landscape, intermediary landscape. I mean, France is extraordinary for politics, as you know, and, and we have um, what we call, uh, you know, a, an incredible number of layers in politicians. Today, we have to convince state, region, department, agglomeration, cities, like 27 different institutions on the same site. And we have been through all these layers with these ideas. And I think because they have a kind of connection with what exists first, they are understandable. And we, we slowly have been convincing people. Almost we are not fired. 
just as a repetition, another campus, part of the same story. And as you see, it's not small. On the top, you have Versailles. And um, the, the frame, this is what we, we have to do, Satori. I know it's a big responsibility when you look at that. You know, sometimes it makes me anxious. And <laughs> not that much, because what they did first was not so, um, I mean, they, they did it. You know, this is a military place, and it will be turned in, in a place for this cluster as well. Because this military, as you know, have been doing fantastic research. So what to do? And of course, history in this case has a certain importance, but not that much. Because you see, Le, Le Nôtre never expanded as we believe. I mean, what I know about Le Nôtre is there were existing traces on site, and it used to be a territory for agriculture and hunting. And what did Le Nôtre on the park is a kind of, um, I don't know, domestication, artialization, if you can have an idea about what it means. So a transformation of the pre-existing tracé within the park. And what is fantastic with Versailles, you probably know that, it, used, it has been the invention of the classic city. And one can see it like, you know, there was a pre-existing landscape. It has been transformed in a park. And what we know is from um, the shape of the park, there was a mirror effect. And they built this new city very quickly from the language done in the park. But in our place in the south, very different. It's, it, it, it was left as a utilitary part for hunting. But still, you can see this geography. You can see some large terrace. Sorry, I, 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 will, I will use this fantastic thing. A terrace, basin, geography, and by the way, amplified with water collection, and some very simple um, organization. And so I will not comment this one, but you will recognize again, amplified geography. Um, there will be a main kind of park system and main public spaces. I mean, we had to address all these three scales again at this scale. Mm. On the top of existing, on the bottom, project. I do not comment it, just to let you understand the kind of exercise we are dealing with. And of course, what interests, interests me is definitely landscape architecture used to be in France, in, Amer in the US, a driving element of um, urban design. And, um, and hopefully, we, we can do it today again. So now the small brother, little brothers. If you, I don't know what time is it, if we have time or not. OK. So a lot of time in this case. So Bordeaux. Uh, you probably have seen picture of this project. So Bordeaux has two banks, of course, as every river has, um, according to what I know. <laughs> and, and we are in charge of this um, right bank, who used to be industrial, which is, which is no longer industrial, of course, which was supposed to be uh, totally built. And um, I convinced the mayor in 2004 to keep 50 hectares, this was a strong negotiation, along the river to build a kind of park along the river in the very center of a city. Think about it. I mean, in America, this has been done you know, 20 times in the 19th century. Even in um, Philadelphia, you have a long park along the river. You had in Boston the same thing, and it was just obvious. Along a river, you would have a park in the center of a city, of course. But today, end of the 20th century, no. In the center of the city, which is a huge urban sprawl, no way. It was built, they kept five meters along the river. There were a few listed trees. And so I convinced this mayor, against every urban designer on the site, not to build 50 hectares, and then to buy 50 hectares, and then to build a park. And Again, I succeeded, 
and, and that's, you know, frustrating in one hand because I cannot show you a fantastic park. This will be done in 50 years. But this is a very important uh, work. You probably have seen this drawing because, of course, to do that corresponds to a management in time. This will be done in a very long time and will use every abandoned and, re and bought parcel to, part per part, piece by piece, build this park. This has been exposed in the exhibition in the MoMA years ago, so maybe you have seen it. And we did some part of it. So uh, 10 hectares is already planted and 10 others are under, I mean, we're working on them. And it's not really a park, as you can see. Um, but I really like that. I mean, this is just a parenthesis, but I like this writing. You know, what I really hate is this kind of young, old parks. See what I mean? You, you have a long surface, a large surface of grass with some future big trees on it. And, and, and you have even sometimes big, but, and you have to wait. They look fake. You know, I really hate that. By the way, even Homestead Park, the few pictures we have of them are not that convincing. Today, I think we cannot do, I mean, we, I love park system, of course, but the way the writing, uh, after time is fine, but at the beginning is inacceptable today. So we, we have to find ways to make it beautiful at every stage, even, you know, this picture is like a few weeks after completion, I mean, the first season. And I like when we find a management in time that produces an interesting and living place anytime. Okay. So, a little brother, Il Seguin, is a very famous place. I mean, a lot of, I guess even in this school, there, are, there have been projects on this place. Because we all have been dreaming and working on it. You know, this used to be um, a factory for cars. It has been abandoned like 20 years ago and still under thinkings. I first did a competition with Renzo Piano 20 years ago. I'm still working on the future urban design with Jean Nouvel, the last competition I won on this island. But waiting for this fantastic completion, we already did a prefiguration garden. And I want to speak about what means a prefiguration garden. Because the crisis really helped us in, a, in a one hand. Because there is a lack of money, um, a lot of projects are not stopped, but prefigure. And it means it's it's interesting because it means giving a public access, um, inventing practices, inventing uses, starting a life, giving traces. I really like that. You know, usually, even out of crisis, it takes 30 years to build this kind of project, and a generation waits in um, wasteland. Is that a good word? In, in you know, sure. wasteland. And it's longer generation, you know, 30 years is very long. And um, I definitely think, and this is something we invented also with students here at Harvard, maybe you remember, Gary, um, 13 years ago, how to deal with this 30 years. We can do something during 30 years. So, sorry, so the project, I do not comment, but this was a factory, it was a fantastic, you know, um, plinth that welcomed both buildings and the machineries. And we thought these traces could be, I mean, evoked in a future public space network. But okay, that I don't care too much. But we did that. And this is very provisory. It's in the very middle of what we are doing now with Jean Nouvel. It's just a place where there is, for the first time in the history of public access, never people were, were, were allowed to come on this built island. So they can come and they can observe everything happening around. It's a kind of observatory. And we more or less, um, how to say that? It's a prototype in another end of what we will do. And it welcomes now a lot of very provisory buildings like this circus and um, conference center, etc., etc. So nothing more to add. But I think it's a very interesting process. So we do that because of the crisis. 
But we have, I think, to work with this idea. Not only doing le grand projet, but accompanying physically mutations. Okay, another project. Uh, uh, it's a big project again, 1,000 hectares. And again, I am landscape architect and in charge of a team with Christian de Porzampar, Pritzker Price, as, you know, sub-consultant. So, not so bad. Uh, I mean, but of course, it's very important. And, you know, in Lens, we just inaugurated this new museum, Le Louvre, done by Katsuyo Sejima, with a garden from Catherine Mosbach. But, of course, public institutions want this museum to be like in Bilbao. You know, there will be an effect of redevelopment of these very poor cities. And to develop these cities, we have to think about urban design and recomposition of a big site. And this is a site, and, and um, it used to be a mining, uh, is that a good word? Yeah, a mining area. And uh, this was very interesting because there were concessions. It was not a city. It was like 10 to 15 concessions given to industrial to make an exploitation for the mining. And they were, they were all autonomous with school, church, everything. And between these concess concessions, like, like, you know, like in a colonial vision, there were wasteland, leftover. And urban designers before us were just trying to fill these voids. And we convinced this collectivity to deal with these voids as not the backyard, but the front. How, how to reverse these old cities, thinking the emptiness between these kind of cities could be the real facade, the new public space network that will give unity and redevelopment. And we convince people. You can see the void I evoke. And one of these void has been, um, is hosting the Louvre of Katsuyo Sejima. And we want to keep all this void and build a network of park and paths. And we convince people to build very soon this first, this is like five kilometers long network and it's again a transformation process. We, we use a lot of existing parts. And we started from something I observed from the mining. To carry material from mine, they built like dikes on which were rolling, uh, not real trains, but very small trains, just to go to, that I have no idea about the English word, but in this kind of mining landscape, you have cones of deposit, terril. And um, the mining exploitation was connected to this cone with these dikes. And we purpose to build this kind of landscape everywhere to build a new network of public space. These public spaces are not fake urban public spaces. They are promenade on the landscape. And the new facade of this city will be done from this landscape. And you know, it's something I discovered even in Minneapolis, where the facade of the city is a lake necklace. I mean, all these houses are facing a park, and the public space is a park, and the, the image of the city is a park. And we already planted 5,000 trees last year, on three kilometers long. Nothing to say, you know, this is after a few weeks of completion, and it starts to build these kilometers of path, and we are in charge of you know, developing them on the whole city. And Christian de Porzampar, we're organizing, relinking all existing with new buildings and this new facade. And we just won a competition. You know, this, you see at the very middle, this green crescent corresponds to what we were in charge in Eura Lens. And now we won a competition to connect all these white cones which will be a huge park system because these industrial uh, have been, these industry have been abandoned like 40 years ago and they are no longer industrial vestiges, they are quite parks because after 40 years of artificial sometimes plantation, 
we have a fantastic heritage of a landscape. And we convince these people to forget their industrial heritage and to work with this kind of neo-geographical heritage in a very positive way. Because they cannot survive during generation and generation with industrial loss, with a, lo sorry, with a loss of industry. And it changed the, the psychology of people. They are looking to their place in a very different way now. We have been working three years on it. Vieux Port de Marseille. So it's a famous picture of France with, uh, I don't know, okay, it's a picturesque place. And we won this competition again, a landscape architect, sorry, it's me, for, of course, uh, <laughs> is leading a, a strong team. My small architect is Norman Foster. <laughs> Fantastic, you know, of course, I'm joking, but it's true. I mean, they accepted, I'm working a lot with Foster and partner, to uh, develop some object, even furniture. And this is very new. Um, they are very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so we won the competition saying, OK, the white U corresponds to a refurbishment of Marseille Arbor. OK. But it makes sense to do it only if we can build the green part, the big green part, which is a park system. And it corresponds to pre-existing public spaces that are all inaccessible and all um, run by different institutions, like military or cultural or region. You know, again, this layering of institution makes it not a unity. Physically, it's a unity. And uh, we convince people to do that. And we will be this year the first path system that will connect them. Of course, because of the crisis, there is no money to really transform them into a real park. But we, we will um, exploit what exists there with this path network. And the third part is you can see light green spots within the city. And um, we are doing a plan guide, and it's a kind of set of rules to um, transform all public spaces in the city. And still, you know, I'm very happy, I'm, I'm working in 20 different countries, but I'm very happy to live in certain countries where there is still a kind of public control on public, sp on public spaces and cities. So we completed uh, a big part of the refurbishment of um, the harbor. And it, you, I don't comment it. It used to be, you know, there, was, there were nine lanes of uh, traffic. There were parking lots, there were uh, private areas, so there were no public spaces. And everything except two lanes of buses and provisory lane of cars, for different reasons, are left. And we earned 70% of space dedicated to pedestrians. So nothing to say, just normal. And Norman Foster is doing a kind of ombrière, which is extremely successful now, completed. You cannot see it in the very bottom. And now we are in charge of this park system. You can see this kind of perspective on the top with a spatial slope, an artificial slope, that connect the park system with the arbor. And Norman Foster, this time, will do something strong with that. I don't know what time is it, so it's still a menu. It's open, so if you want a dessert or something, we can <laughs> do something. For... OK, so plenty of time. It's a good thing. I will speak about Doha in Qatar. You know, it's something very strange. What means working in Hong Kong, Doha, Paris, East Hanover, et cetera, et cetera, for a poor landscape architect? I mean, I think I, I really don't want to be an, ex, an exportateur, if this word makes sense to you. I have nothing to sell, not a product, not a style. I mean, I know some architects that could do it easily. A landscape architect cannot do it. I mean, because we have to deal with pre-existing situations. We have only to transform pre-existing places. And uh, even in one of the more cynical countries, um, I'm not an exportateur. And I'm doing the same work in Doha, the same method in Doha than in uh, Saclay. That's very important. It's a deontological issue. But they are very strong, as you know. And the red spots correspond to a project we are doing in, we are doing in Doha. 
And by the way, you can see the airport very close to, I mean, the lower red part. So it means this is three kilometers long. So think about the other one. It's not so small. And we are doing this project, by the way, with Ram Colas, Jean Nouvel, mostly. And just a few pictures, you know, it's a huge work. I mean, it's a big part of our activity. And I really love this place. And of course, the desert is something complex. And you can see the same place when it's dry and when it rains, because of course it rains, not a lot, but when it rains, it rains hardly. And it builds this kind of shape. This is exactly the place where, with Ram Colas, we are thinking about the university campus. And you see it wet and not wet. And of course, we have to deal with. It's fantastic for us. We could have built a fantastic pipe network and having it totally clean. Of course, it's not the way we are going to work. And you see the scale again, 200 meters. I do not comment. I love these pictures. And there were agriculture. This is an anecdote, but when we first, the first project I did with is Jean Nouvel, it's under construction, it's a new museum in Doha. And I don't know why, by facility, we came with a round drawing, you know, drawing of fantastic green disc, like you can see on Google Earth. When we show that to the Emir, he said, but I don't want that, this is for American. Um, and he, he gave us his helicopter just to, to fly over Qatar in a more detailed way. Didn't, no, I don't want this round. This has been done in Saudi Arabia by American people, but we don't want it. We have an identity. You know, we thought there, were, there was nothing. And of course, we discovered with his advice that there were a lot of farms, small farming, small agriculture, very small one, but very intelligent one. So where there, were, where there was some humidity, some moisture, some building was done in a very locally, okay. And so this university will have a landscape that will welcome architecture, of course, again, which will be a mixed up of this um, natural landscape with water and kind of uh, this language, this scale defined by the farming. It's sort of very simple, so I don't, I don't comment it. There are texts that help me not speak. And there is all a vision about agriculture. They decided to be less, uh, to be more autonomous about food. And they are developing a farm network. And of course, they have a fantastic um, heritage about how to do it. And around this university, we have to develop agricultural fields. So these are you know, the study models we propose to OMA, and then, they, of course, in the same time, they work with that, defining um, the urban design. We are in charge of a very large park that is in... Um, um, sorry, I forgot the name. There, there is a special name, but a kind of dry river, and we have to deal with some relief. And on this study model's picture, you can recognize the place where water will be when it rains hard, where some topography will be done because we have to deal with materials, and where some kind of farm, real farm, will be developed. I mean, this park is three kilometers long. And this dune will be, you know, uh, covered by a kind of desert and some plants on the desert. And it's a huge work to, to work with this kind of very specific vegetation. Okay, so small brothers. So this is in Moscow. They are building a. St so of course there is a connection between Qatar University, Saclay, and Moscow University, of course, and of course the place we are. Skolkovo is. Um, a project of like Saclay. But they hired a lot of architects like Herzog de Meuron, Katsuyo Sejima, Rem Colas, David Chipperfield, etc., etc. And we did a first master plan with landscape architecture. And it's, I do not comment it except these two pictures. And it's all a forest structure. 
that works with both traces of agriculture and natural pre-existing sites. Um, in another lecture, I could, uh, I could show uh, the way we are working. We are trying to do a kind of neo pittoresque way. So we started from um, survey of existing landscape and we try to amplify it again because we need to deal with water. So dealing with, I mean, not in, exactly in the opposite way that in Qatar, of course, because there is too much water. So, so we are trying to deal with an amplification of pre-existing topography and uh, of course forest is a key um, is a key component and I, I love this landscape my mother is from russia nothing to see with that but just to record governor's island of course um, my colleague won it i was with him yesterday we are always in competition sometimes you win sometimes i win he won it but i still love this project we did <laughs> You know, and it was think, uh, we were thinking it was the very beginning of the crisis, and um, we, we thought with uh, somebody from ex OMA that is now Rex that um, it could have been, you know, something like uh, experimental uh, small agriculture within the city. We didn't convince at this time, except Michelle Obama had l later a small garden in Washington. We were very happy with that, <laughs> but we came too early, you know. And this was a commission Adrian Goes gave me, you know, so we are competitors, but sometimes not that enemy. And he, he gave me this commission for Biennale, and you probably have seen this drawing, I still love them. And this is a way how to, you know, how to define uh, urban fabric from a uh, geographical constraint. I don't, do not comment it. Now, quite the last picture, so Bull, Burgos Boulevard with Herzog et de Meuron. It used to, so only this picture, it used to be a railway track within an important city in Spain, nine kilometers long, and the railway moves to another station for, with a fast lane, and we were in charge to do a kind of urban boulevard. We didn't make an urban boulevard. We did a real, we did a real landscape with road and street, of course, but we made a strong differentiation between rural parts and urban parts. And you have these two pictures showing both rural and urban parts. And we planted 5,000 trees. Um, and it's a huge change in this city. What was the back of the city, you know, the real backyard along the railway tracks now is, um, you know, is a facade and is a landscape within the city. And we define these public spaces not like a succession, you know, of piazza, street, gardens, but the whole thing is landscape. I really, I, I like that. And it's like a river in the city. Last picture. So the smaller project, it's in the Ministère de la Culture in Paris. And we did uh, 170 square meters, so one, you, you can translate, in square feet, 1,700. So very, very small, and it's a miniature of a forest. And there are 1,000 plants of 100 different species. And this picture has been taken a few weeks after completion. And this was the third time we did, so this is serious, the, the less serious thing is, this, this was the third time we did it. It died two times first, because, no, I'm serious. I really like this project as prototype. The first one we did it with Patrick Blanc, you know, the guy that invented these vertical gardens, and he's a very good botanist. And we imported uh, underwood of a sub-tropical forest uh, in Australia. And this corresponded perfectly to Parisian condition in a courtyard, in theory. <laughs> it was fantastic, but one tree died, somebody sued a, co a contractor, and then it was abandoned. It could have been working. So what I must say, we are still working on it, and I really like working with this kind of botanist, not in a simply respectful way, but how to adapt some uh, new condition to a new context in a, a, a very, um, I don't know, clever, scientific way. Okay, it's finished. <laughs> Thanks very much.
for that. Um, maybe you'll take some questions. Any questions? Thanks. Um, I just was wondering, with the Cycle project, with uh, that big of a scale, do you care about the pedestrian perception of the whole? Uh, because I remember walking in um, in Paris Sud, and from the RER station, and it was really hot. It was crushing, and I would just walk and walk and walk and feel this wasteland of, of campus space, and I was wondering whether you consider that in your design. Oh, it's, um, it's a nice question. Um, and it could have been the start of the presentation, because before us, of course, other urban designers have been working for decades on this project. And they had an illusion trying to make a unique a unity, giving, giving a unity to this space. And they found, I mean, this was Reichen, Bernard Reichen, maybe you know him, he's famous as an urban designer. And um, I mean, everybody could be wrong on that. So, so it's, it's not a bad critic about his work. So he had the seven, I'm speaking about the south of the plateau, the 10 kilometer scale. Of course, 30 kilometers is not your question. So 10 kilometers is your question. And he had the illusion to make it as a single quartier. And he had a density on the 900 hectares and not on the 400 hectares that we can do now. And of course, we realized that because of distance between buildings or even node of intensity would be too big, one couldn't walk from one to another. And at the end, one could walk between nothing. So you see the paradox with a positive um, will to make it a unity, he would have built a place where no one would have been walking because distance would have been too big. That's why we decided to work with the archipelago vision at every scale. So even on the 10 kilometer scale, there will be three, four no quartier campuses, 2.5 kilometer. And of course, nobody will walk between Cartier. They will take metro, bicycle, cars, as everywhere. Nobody in Paris walk from La Défense to Le Louvre. Makes no sense. So, but one walk, one kilometer, or 400 meters to reach a metro station, a bus station, or another building. So that's why we are doing all these accommodation processes from a scale to another. Because one will walk 400 meters to go to the metro, this is a kind of rule. And one sometime will walk one kilometer to do, to, 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 to do sport in this intermediary landscape. Nobody will walk 10 kilometers except some joggers at night. So I guess this is a, an answer to your question, you know, and it's a very important one. That's why we must accommodate any time to the real scale we are working with. Okay? And of course, obviously, we must give some comfort. I mean, in such a plateau, a windy plateau, there will be, um, uh, we'll work with earth to, to protect from wind, we'll work with trees to protect from wind, we'll, we'll, we'll find the good exposure, etc., etc., to give some comfort, of course. To, to work on it today is just impossible. Um, you, you mentioned a couple of times in your talk that you were improvising. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about improvisation in relation to Saclay. I couldn't help but thinking that the project <clears throat> is a very interesting illustration of landscape architecture as a practice of improvisation. In, um, and I'm thinking about two, two different aspects of improvisation. The first is a kind of uncertainty, a radical uncertainty, a precariousness that's dependent on others, dependent on other things. Um, and the second has to do with the relationship between technique and intuition. That, that improvisation is always, in, in, certainly in music, it's about the relationship between um, uh, this uncertainty but also the uh, kind of subjective, a radically subjective uncertainty, um, but also technique, a kind of rehearsal, a technique that's well trained. 
And I'm one, it seemed to me that Saclay was a wonderful illustration of that in urbanism, and urbanism rarely can be as improvisational as that. Okay, I will answer in random. Improvising? <laughs> no, maybe with the easier part is about a technique. Because of course, um, I show you these already three years of work of a lot of people with a few slides, with a few, I mean, ad academic concepts. But of course, we have a lot of people working on it, like hydraulicians, I mean, engineers specialize in water, in environment, in uh, everything that, you know, like, um, I mean, stupid animals you have in this place, you know, everything. So, so we have to deal with regulation as well. I mean, ecology is something like constant, unfortunately. Even if I'm very interested in ecology, but ecology has been um, uh, used in different ways. So, of course, we, because we have to address a lot of technical issues and reg regulations issue, what we are drawing uh, deals with all these techniques input. And, and we want to involve uh, you know, uh, these, the schools that will come in the definition of, and the uses of what we are doing. So there is a strong connection between techniques and this project for these reasons. But to, to try to answer to the first part of your question is um, this answer I cannot say it, but uncertainty, is that the word? Uncertainty. uncertainty. It's very important. I mean, uh, James Corner wrote a fantastic text for me one day uh, on a book, you probably read it. And um, I don't know what to say, but um, when I show it in a lecture, it everything could look very deductive. So there is a reason. There is a base, I mean, there is an heritage, there is a language, there is a... And um, with the deduction process, we will find solution and a drawing. And it's not true. It's absolutely not true. And I recently did a lecture where my colleague Michel Corajou, you probably know him, not a young guy, told me, but at the end you are boring, uh, uh, he, he said. Oh, and... Um, because he said, what interests me is, how do you do that? And um, it's true, I, I don't speak about that in this lecture. How do we do these um, shapes? How do we find, it's not a deductive process only, of course. It's an, of course, there, as everybody, there is a lot of intuition. I mean, uh, every landscape architect in his way. So there is a lot of intuition from the beginning. And, um, and the way we draw it is, um, yes, it's something different. It has no deduction uh, basement. I don't know if this is an answer, but it's key. I mean, in the next lecture, I will speak only about that. How do we do, I mean, about shapes? How, how do we do that? I really don't know. That's my big concern. I, um, I have the <coughs> microphone, so I'm going to ask my question. Um, the Creating a young landscape just to be a young landscape instead of creating a young landscape that's supposed to look like an old landscape is very liberating. What do you do 10 years after you've planted many of the landscapes that you have? Do you edit things? Do you have a plan that the city has to follow to get to the next phase? So that's very important because we, we try to convince people saying we will have a management process in time, and so you will have fantastic result, I mean, good result anytime. Sometimes they do not understand, sometimes they forget. So not, you know, we are speaking mostly about public commissions. Of course, if this is a private park, it's easy. But with public commissioners, it's more difficult because, as you know, politicians are changing. They have a, another rhythm that we have and then gardens have, and sometimes there could be, you know, loss in what we are trying. But, um, so there are good cases where people never forget us, and uh, there is a park that I'm doing by layers from 20 years. So every three years we come back and we had a layer. And that's very important because, by the way, at the beginning we just have trees. 
And slowly we have been heading a path, and then another path, and then a bridge, and then a bench, and then a playground, blah, blah. But, but you know, what I really hate is this kind of ghost city and ghost parks where you have everything. You know, you, you are, there is nothing, but you have a street, a pavement, a bench, a lamppost, uh, everything, and a tree. So I would have the tree, and then we'll see. For that, it requires a certain um, reliability of uh, relationship between people, and this is, of course, casual. So we have very good cases where it works. And um, in the worst case, they have to do something. The, the way we plan trees is so dense that they are obliged to do something. So, 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 so I really like it. And, and I could say some word about that. I really like to plant with a strong density at the beginning. And I realize that this is very cultural. I mean, in, uh, in America, I've seen that people like Kylie and uh, Sasaki and Robert Zion and others have been dealing with very dense plantation from the 50s in a very clever way. And it gives very good result. My colleague in Switzerland, Vogt, worked work with very dense uh, plantations. German people are not scared about that. Russian people, uh, even during the regime, have been dealing with very strong densities, like uh, forest men in a city. And it's very, very cultural. In France, we are hygienist. I don't know how to translate that. Hygiene is um, hygienist. So a tree must never touch another one. <laughs> so, so that's something inacceptable. You know, it's uh, everything but not that. So we have to convince people in a very difficult way. And, and it's um, recently um, somebody that has a real um, historical knowledge found picture from a Renaissance garden that is still in, in um, that still looks like it, it, it has been built. And people at the Renaissance used to work with trees in a very dense way. And I do remember that Le Nôtre, at the very beginning, used to work with forests surrounded by dense edges. And we have a bad picture of Le Nôtre works because now we have alignment of trees within the Allée. But these alignments in Versailles have been added by Louis Philippe later. And in the restoration process, people decided to keep, to keep these alignments that give a fake uh, notion of proportion Le Nôtre has. So density is a key point in my work. I really like that, to work with very dense. I, I prefer the micro wood than the tree. And this requires, a, you know, so we have to work again on it. Even if, they, if we are fired, they will have to do something. Um, could you say something about how important is physical geography to your design? So I'm thinking about if you had to give a ratio of percentage of an importance to, to say, the desert or the plateau or the sort of found geology or physical geography that then you come in and you propose something on it or you design from it. If you had to co sort of give a proportion um, ratio to the importance of the place that you found, and if you came to Doha and you were, st you were thinking about a circular object and then he told you, no, go fly around in my helicopter and sort of let the physical geography speak to you. Or um, you sort of imposed Washington DC on Saclay, two very different physical geographies. But how, how important would you say is the found condition that you come work in? I'm not so sure I understand your question. So uh, I'm trying to say is like at the end, does, does the physical geography that you work in, is there a, a design solution that exists in sort of the existence of the place, or is that something that you impose upon it and then work with it? How much of it do you derive, exactly, how much of the physical place derives a design solution versus something that you come with in the way that you think about a place and then that design comes from it? Okay, I think I will say several things and maybe some will fit in your question, hopefully. So, um, in random. So, so first, um, a critic uh, told me a day that th there is something confusing in what I say sometimes, is the um, difference between natural geography and built geography. Because usually a landscape architect could speak about 
geographies evoking a kind of perfect natural geography that is never existing. So, and, and, um, and of course, we are not in grades to, you know, it would be stupid to try to, to restore a kind of pre-existing natural geography. So it's some so, sometimes we have to be very clear about what is natural, what is built. And the built geography is sometimes extremely interesting. And sometimes it's a dominant. In Saclay, you have everything about it. You have some geographical, natural geographical pre-existence, like topography. And you have sometimes all these agricultural traces, and you have even campuses, tra traces, road systems. And all this is part of what I understand from your question, like physical geography. But they are both natural and artificial. And both are interesting. And what I really believe is we, I mean, I like to give clarity to these different components. Usually, when an architect is dealing with landscape architecture, he speaks about green is nature, I mean, or green will be geography. But in landscape architecture domain as well, I mean, we could have this too simplified vision about everything being geography, natural one, which is true. I mean, mostly we are dealing with artificial geography. And we could add sometime um, something very new. I mean, I'm not scared about the total artifice, except, um, you know, when, when I think about Qatar, Qatar is a very special country through um, all these countries in the Gulf. There are places where I would never work. Only uh, Abu Dhabi were doing the Louvre with Jean Nouvel, but except that, I would do nothing. When you look at Google Earth, you could be just shocked. I mean, what is this? What is this? What is, and, and there are people with absolutely no doubt about doing whatever with an incredible artifice. And it makes me, I don't know, sometimes it, it gives trouble. I mean, I, I've, I have no moral about it. It's not so easy to, to, to have a thinking about it. You know, It's too easy to say it exists. For, for what I'm doing, I, tried, I, I hope I will not be shocked looking on Google Earth on my own project. <laughs> but it happened. So, so is that, I mean, part of a, an answer? Maybe one more? Hmm? One more question? Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm jet lag already, so it could stay for hours. <laughs> <laughs> Unless there's uh, somebody jumping up, I wanted to take a moment. Um, a couple of things. Um, I'm glad you showed Marseille in part um, because you referenced the Plan Guide, uh, Alexander Chimatov. Chimatov was here two years ago in this space talking about the idea of the Plan Guide. And there's something about that, that particular history and the history of French landscape that we could talk more about. But for our purposes here this evening, I, again, I want to underscore um, this idea of the, the reception of indeterminacy. You spoke about indeterminacy and the, important of it, and the importance of it recently. Um, and at the same moment, in certain circles, uh, it seems to have been, particularly on this side of the Atlantic, construed as a kind of um, in opposition to cultural formation, that somehow indeterminacy is, is uh, processual and ultimately delays or even postpones indefinitely uh, formation, spatial cultural formation. Um, and in that regard, I think what you've presented this evening is an extraordinary, um, an extraordinary body of evidence in which it's completely compatible. The idea that the landscape architect is the urbanist of our age, that's what we've been talking about in the school recently, is completely com compatible with this idea of open-endedness, a, a non-deductive linear process, but in which um, traces of those things manifest themselves. I mean, among the things we've been discussing also in the school recently that you touched on, the idea that 15 years ago, 14 years ago, 13 years ago, as Penn and uh, the GSD and other places had this rediscovery of French landscape architecture, um, it's not a coincidence at that moment that as we began to invite uh, you, Michelle, and others uh, to, various, um, to various cultural events and programs and exhibitions, there was this reappreciation of the sense of the relationship between agricultural formation uh, and cultural formation in landscape architecture. And at the same moment, um, the idea that the landscape would be the urbanist of our age was a claim, as you say. It was a, it was a, a project, and yet at the same moment in this 
kind of moment of middle, middle agedness for that project, you now have this incredible body of work. So th thank you so much for being here and for sharing it with us. Thanks.